Hi, Omar. Hi, Frank. Thanks for making some time to, to talk to me uh, today. It's much appreciated. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me. So you're, you're a British Egyptian pedi pediatric uh, neurologist. You are the co-founder of Gaza Medic Voices. And you've been traveling to, to Gaza in the West Bank, uh, you know, I guess on and off to teach since 2011. Uh, most of the time, I think, with a delegation of um, Oxford-based medics and surgeons, right? And that's that's right. Yeah, that's all right. Correct. Um, I was wondering, I mean, you, we all seeing devastating images, uh, we reading devastating reports. Um, more than I think now it's about 4,000 children have died in Gaza. Um, we were talking before and you were telling me like you're actually in touch with people in Gaza in, in various sort of hospitals and uh, do you have any updates? What, what do they tell you, you know? Yeah, sure. So as you said, Frank, um, we've been con continuous communication with doctors, surgeons, nurses, paramedics on the ground. Many of them are friends and colleagues. We've built up relationships over 10 years and some of the team members between them, we have probably 20 to 30 years experience of being inside Gaza. So, um, you know, the context is every day has been worse than the day before. Every week has been worse than the week before. And this is what the doctors are telling us. Uh, I spoke to one colleague who was actually a medical student. I was teaching four years ago and is now a, a resident, uh, you know, training doctor in one of the major hospitals. And his exact words uh, about when I asked him, give us an update as to what is happening, where we are living in the apocalypse. This is hell on earth. He described uh, his hospital sheltering 15,000 people within the hospital grounds. This is a hospital that normal bed occupancy rates for it would be three to 400 beds. So on top of the 1,000 patients they are looking after, sorry, 2,000 patients they are looking after, they have 15,000 people there in the hospital who are not even injured or they're just sheltering for safety because they think the hospitals are safe. The reality is the hospitals are not safe. And we've seen the targeting of healthcare facilities. The last update he gave me was um, one of the things which is very upsetting being a doctor myself and a healthcare professional is many of his colleagues have been killed. Um, he named three very close colleagues who have died in the last week. One of them was a female doctor who was pregnant uh, with her uh, baby and her three-year-old son, all killed in one Israeli airstrike, um, including the fetus. And her husband was paralyzed from the neck down from a spinal cord injury and is now in intensive care. He also told me about uh, a, his best friend, who was also a doctor, who had finished the 72-hour work shift and gone back home. Um, and on arrival, his building was shelled. When they recovered the body, it was decapitated. There was no head attached to the body. Uh, these are the kind of very horrific circumstances these doctors are working in. In terms of the actual supplies, um, I think, and, and capacity, they are struggling because they are running out of antibiotics. They're running out of basic uh, uh, sanitation, uh, clean, cleaning equipment, equipment for surgeries and, and procedures. And in addition, the lack of fuel means that many of the generators are cutting out. He again mentioned to me that in their unit, the neonatal unit, which looks after premature babies on in incubators, um, many of those incubators stopped functioning and a, a number of babies have died that could have been salvaged or should have been you know, alive today had that not happened. So it is a pretty grim picture. Not pretty, it's it's it's, it's extremely grim picture. It is, um, as he said, hell on earth. And I specifically asked him, you know, what's your message to the outside world? And he said, we don't need your money. We don't need your food. We don't need your sympathy or your prayers. We have God with us, but we need a ceasefire now. That's That's all he could say to me, that they are begging the world for a ceasefire, for the West to intervene. Thanks, Omar. Um, we, um, can you tell us, I mean, I, I, because like one thing that sort of bothers me is that we always talk about the dead, right? So we, we sort of around 4,000 dead children now. Uh, we know Gaza is pretty much more than 50% of under 16. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the population in Gaza is very, very young. Um, we're only talking about the dead and we should talk about the dead. 
but other children are facing a life of trauma, either psychological or, I mean, the type of injuries, even if they didn't die, will just, you know, uh, be a, change their lives, right? What, what, what type of, so there's the dead, uh, they are the dead, and what, what type of injuries uh, do you know about, or do you see? Yeah, of course, that's a great point, Frank. So, you know, they've, the same doctor said to me, almost to these words, to this effect, the dead are dead. And the dead are the lucky ones. The ones that are alive are the unlucky ones. Because the ones that are alive, and let's talk about the children, these are some of them have sustained injuries that will need decades and a lifetime of intervention by doctors, by surgeons. These are horrific uh, burns, third degree burns from you know the face down. These are children who have been disfigured. These are children who have had uh, complex fractures, complex uh, orthopedic um, issues as a result of shelling or uh, artillery or, um, um, you know, munitions. Uh, and on top of that, we know, and this is what Dr. Hassan Abu Sitta, who is a famous uh, British doctor, surgeon, sorry, doctor, surgeon, plastic surgeon is based there now. He said to me that he has seen, he's seen burns that are consistent with white phosphorus munitions and the humans, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International both confirmed that there is the use of white phosphorus, um, you know, within the occupied Palestinian territories. And we've seen a precedent for that. But on top of that, he's seeing injuries and burns that he has never seen before. So he said to me, there are types of injuries and burns that he can't even begin to describe. And he said they would be consistent with chemicals or munitions that have not been used before. And, you know, that to them, and I think to any international uh, respectable body would amount to war crimes. This is the use of, uh, you know, highly uh, caustic or toxic chemicals in areas of high civilian population. So what I also really want to add is, you know, we talk about the injured from direct effects of war. You mentioned about the indirect effects of war, which, or you, you mentioned about the psychological trauma and burden. So absolutely, we've seen pictures and videos of children who have been orphaned, who have lost their whole family, wiped out in one airstrike, and these children are traumatized. Often you see them shaking, you know, the kind of effects of PTSD in the early stages, just a complete shock. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, who spoke to me from Gaza, also mentioned about patients dying from shock. So he's seen patients have a cardiac arrest from the from the fear and terror that they are experiencing from, you know, air raids, uh, which is uh, frankly, you know, I've never come across that. You know, we don't see that in our medical textbooks, but that is something that is happening. And the last thing to say, the types of injuries, the types of um, health effects are also what we call excess mortality. So as a result of uh, people dying from uh, being looked after for trauma, that means there is less attention and less capacity to look after children with cancer. There's less capacity to look after men and women with heart attacks or strokes. And as a result, that is uh, very dangerous. And we will see and we are seeing excess deaths from other causes as well yeah thanks omar um again i remember reading and i think this was after operation cast lead i mean that's what the israeli called it another massacre in 2008 2009 i think the british medical uh journal had um you know researched and uh, issued a report saying that and i can't remember exactly but like 55, 60% of the under 16 in Gaza were uh, medically depressed. And I'd, no, they had lost the will to leave. That's, I remember now. I'd lost the will to leave. So you really wonder. I mean, I'm not wondering what Israel is trying to achieve. I know what Israel is trying to but, you know, this cannot be good for the future of these this, children. I, I have a term for this. I call it psych psychological terrorism. It's so a psychological terrorism where you inflict fear and terror in the hearts of the people that you're attacking. And this has been happening consistently. We've seen this with, and it's quite um, it's quite insidious and it's quite actually uh, deliberate. So you see these sonic booms from uh, military Israeli flights, uh, planes that would happen intermittently in the middle of the night in Gaza. And, and you know, there's reported in the literature, in the medical literature, the BMJ, the Lancet have reported cases and in high volumes of cases of, for example, children bedwetting and you know, children who are potty trained who start bedwetting because of the fear of the sound of the sonic boom. So 
this is part of the agenda and this is part of uh you know the the essentially when you put a population under siege and blockade them for 17 years not only are you depriving them of basic humanitarian rights but you're also depriving them of the hope and you want to stifle that hope because if you stifle that hope then that is a way to basically defeat what you see as the enemy and i think that is exactly what is happening so uh the other thing to note is the healthcare workers who i spoke to including dr ibrahim i said to him you know how are you managing to talk to me so calmly about your best friend losing literally his body being separated from his head how can you say that to me without breaking down and he said to me i do break down i break down every three to four days i have a complete meltdown where i cannot function i'm sobbing and i'm terrified but i have to collect myself i have to look after these patients if i don't who else will so this is my obligation and duty and i'm i would rather die a martyr in his words in the hospital looking after a patient than running away and trying to get out um from the border in in egypt or wherever wherever there is an exit point can you uh can you i mean from you know you've you've had sort of a decade pretty much of experience working in gaza and in, in the west bank um, can you talk to us, uh, to me, about um, Israel targeting of medical facilities, hospitals, ambulances, rescue workers? I was working, I was um, talking recently to John Dugard, former UN special envoy to Israel Palestine, who told me that during Operation Cast Lead, he was the, in charge of the report for the Arab League. Uh, Israel targeted more than uh, 30 schools around the same numbers of mosques and around 25 hospitals. Israel defends itself by saying that they sometimes target hospitals and stuff because Hamas or Islamic Jihad or any faction is hiding in hospitals. But from your experience, yeah. does Israel actually deliberately target hospital? Look, um... To be honest, I am not a military strategist, so it's very difficult to prove intent. That is a problem. It's, diff it's difficult to prove intent, especially uh, in this context. But at the same time, when you see, uh, for example, our Ahli hospital being bombed with 500 deaths in one split second and possibly another 500 under the rubble that were unaccounted for, you know, and then you see the next day um, the evacuation order to leave Al Shifa hospital and to say that if you don't believe we may have to bomb it so that is an intent for, that's intent for me I don't know what else that is that is making it clear the audacity of saying we will attack a healthcare facility to basically wipe out Hamas and in the collateral damage will be the whole hospital every one of your cancer patients every one of your children on the ward every one of your, your ventilated patients that's for them collateral damage so there is a precedent, as you said, from all the way back to Operation Castle and prior to that, in the West Bank in the 90s, we forget around the time of the Intifada, the targeting of civilians, the targeting of healthcare workers, the targeting of UN and UNRWA staff. I mean, the UN and UNRWA have lost so many of their staff to, you know, they, it's almost like Israel wages war on UNRWA. Like for them, this is, um, and, and I think, and this is my personal feeling and the pers feeling of many of my colleagues, I feel that the agenda is, and this is actually quoted directly from Dr. Mads Gilbert, who's a Norwegian doctor that goes in very often to Gaza. He said they not only want to kill civilians, but they actually want to obliterate and kill journalists or people who will bear witness. So for them to attack UN and, and these staff who are basically or Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, to kill their staff, which is happening, we've seen this, and to kill journalists, you know, European journalists, not just, uh, you know, Arab journalists, and this is basically a way to silence those voices and to mean that their agenda continues. So I think uh, there is for sure that in, in terms of that question about the tunnels and, you know, this this continued narrative of tunnels under the hospitals uh, being used, I can tell you from a decade of experience and, and my colleagues can tell you being there and going there every year. We have never seen anything to that effect. We've been allowed in every operating theater. We've been allowed through every door. So actually, it's a very dangerous narrative. And I actually want to highlight something from the medical body. So The Lancet, which is one of the leading medical journals in the world, and actually has taken a, a very good stance on this and called out Israel for its essential war crimes previously. You know, they recently published this editorial 
And they, the, the editor-in-chief who's been to Gaza a number of times said that when you go inside the healthcare facilities, there are pictures of Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden on the wall. And this means that the population has been radicalized. That is insane. I have never, I have never seen a single picture of bin Laden or Saddam Hussein in any of these facilities. Yes, I've seen pictures of Yasser Arafat, but you know, Yasser Arafat was seen as a Palestine Palestinian um, uh, rebel and someone who was, you know, standing up for human for their rights. I know he's been labeled as a terrorist in the West ever since, but at that time he was, you know, he was someone that was looked up to. So, I think it's really dangerous this this narrative and this continual association of healthcare facilities with uh, terrorist groups or, you know, Islamic Jihad or ISIS is, is a very, very dangerous uh, situation. I mean, of course, but it's, ob it's obviously part of the plan, right? You dehumanize, dehumanize them, turn them into animals, uh, terrorist loving people, and then you, you genocide them. Um, so we know it, it's yeah. part of the plan. Human animals, as uh, the Israeli defense minister yeah. called them, uh, human animals. I want to I want to ask you a, a, a last sort of question um, because we have to try uh, us activists, journalists, medics uh, that are supporting um, you know peace, human rights for Palestinians, you know freedom for Palestine. We have to try to imagine how we can help them, how we can move on in the sense of obviously not moving on from what's happening in Gaza, but move on and, and, and make the struggle better and, and make sure that this is indeed going to change everything. This is indeed, you know, because I remember this was being said after Operation Cast Lead, you know, Israel shot itself in the foot. It's going to change everything. It didn't. Uh, what can we do? I know you're doing a lot. Uh, you actually um, in charge, I don't know if you're in charge, but you're organizing a vigil in London uh, tomorrow on Friday. I, I think it's 6 p.m. outside of... Um, I said of 10 Whitehall. Downing Street. 10 Downing Street, yeah. Yeah, Downing, yeah. Yeah, Downing, Downing Street by Whitehall. He's on Whitehall, yeah. Can you, uh, can you briefly, yeah, sort of to end our conversation, tell us what you think we, we can do and, uh, and maybe talk to us about the vigil briefly? Of course. So I think, I think what I've been saying, I've been saying it since day one and initially I was at risk of being cancelled, but, um, you know, luckily people are listening maybe because I come from a humanitarian side, but, I think civil society is responsible in this. When our politicians fail us, which has happened in every, you know, large conflict, we've seen it at the Iraq war. We saw it in different times. Civil society is basically responsible to start mobilizing. And that is what we are seeing. And people are in the hundreds of thousands in many cities across the world, in London, in Paris, in New York. These people are getting, going out on the street and saying, we need a ceasefire now. So when you have enough of a voice as a collective voice, that will apply pressure on our governments. Having said that, we've seen 2 million people in the streets of London calling for the Iraq war not to happen, and it still happened. So, you know, you have to think, and I think the, the next step is to basically escalate and um, think about sort of, um, you know, this is not my personal opinion, but this is the opinion of many, many people will say um, you need to, um, sorry, Frank, it just someone is trying to call me at the same time. So um, you have to say basically, you have to consider escalating to boycott and 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 sanctions essentially essentially because we know that apartheid south africa only responded in the end to pressure from financial pressures money talks in this world and if money talks then you have to kind of go through that angle in terms of healthcare professionals and this is my limited role and i'm a humble servant to a huge team who are basically behind the scenes organizing this we have been saying as a medical community enough is enough a ceasefire has to happen, and we feel it's within our rights to go and protest and stand outside Downing Street in a, in a vigil and direct a message directly to Rishi Sunak, the British government, our prime minister, and the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, uh, who talks about hate marches. You know, we will show her tomorrow. These are not hate marches. These are peaceful vigils, family friendly, where we are uniting in our humanity and in, in our collective disgust what is happening to other human beings and people who whose value whose 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 value in terms of life should be equal to any one of us you know i am lucky that my seven-year-old daughter and i and my wife were born uh, and lived in the west we are just that is that is our cards we got handed those cards 
My daughter and I and my wife could have been born in Gaza. We could have been living in Gaza. These people are just like us. And there's continual dehumanization by Western media, by Western governments, by Israel is, you know, negating that. And and not only that, but, you know, this vigil, the reason it's happening, Frank, is we have been silenced. So we tried to hold a fundraiser in the UK to raise one million pounds for Gaza, humanitarian aid to build hospitals, to help uh, donations towards the cause. And we were cancelled from every venue that we approached for security threats, for security reasons. And, and you know, frankly, I come from Egypt. And in Egypt, we get, you know, we get told by the UK government, we live in a police state or you live in a dictatorship. I'm sorry, but if you are being threatened with not being able to go on Saturday to march uh, because it's, it, it conf it's a conflict with Armistice Day, if you are being told that these are hate marches and you're being cancelled from venues, what is that apart from a police state? What, what, you know, what, how else would you would you define a police state where the police actually decides whether you can voice your rights or not? Um, and and it's it's a really slippery slope, and it's actually, I think, uh, unmasked quite a lot of the hypocrisy and double standards that we see in our own governments. Thanks, Omar. Um, this uh, this is much appreciated. Um, uh, so thank you for doing this uh, while on your way to pick up someone uh, at the airport for the march and uh, the vigil on, on Friday. So yeah, thanks no again. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.